the chair of <laughs> this panel. Yeah. I'm Kang Wook, an assistant professor in political science at Jeonbuk National University, South Korea. Uh, firstly, I uh, thank you for inviting me to chair this wonderful panel. And especially, I would like to express my appreciation to Masaki for suggesting me uh, this role and Toby for organizing this wonderful conference. Uh, I'm glad to serve as the chair. Um, this is a significant moment in my academic career because this is my first opportunity to chair a panel at a conference. Uh, I'm happy to share this valuable experience with all of you. Um, the title of our panel is Lessons from Pandemic. Uh, during this session, we will explore the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on electoral integrity worldwide. We have four outstanding papers that examine this topic. Uh, given uh, considering the pandemic is uh, the recent uh, situation, uh, I think it is remarkable to see uh, the diligence of all of these authors in producing great paper that connect this current issue to electoral integrity. Um, each presenter will be allotted uh, 15 minutes to discuss their um, fantastic paper. And Susumu and I then spend uh, five minutes providing comments on each paper. Uh, this means each discussant will have 10 minutes for their discussion. Uh, following the presentation and discussion, we'll open the floor for further discussion. So, um, so uh, I think uh, we, uh, we, pr we probably need to start with uh, Toby's first paper. The title is Elections During Emergency and Crisis. Uh, are you ready, Toby? Thank you so much for, um, for the uh, introductions and for, for, for chairing the panel, which we really appreciate. So this paper is not quite a paper. It is uh, a book and it's a book edited by myself, um, but also Alistair Clark at Newcastle University and also um, Eric Aspen of International Idea. And it's a very long book. Uh, it's a book which is over 700 pages. And so um, the good news is that I'm not going to try to, to cover all of the book in this, pre in this presentation, but instead to pick out some of the key themes and key, and, and key lessons. And importantly, it's a book which tries to speak to two audiences, both um, practitioner audiences, people involved in running elections, but also the, the kind of policy community around the world, but also for academics as well. And that writing for both can be can be quite a challenge, but we think that the, the book has something important to say to both communities. Um, and I guess the very uh, short version of the book is that the pandemic uh, posed a really unprecedented threat to elections around the world. Nothing like this had been uh, seen before. There was no kind of template for people um, to work from. And our key findings really are that the pandemic exposed electoral integrity in countries where there were already weaknesses in the electoral machinery. And crucially, now is the time for countries to actually revise their electoral machinery and uh, change the way in which elections are run to make sure that they are prepared for the next pandemic going forward. We have in the book uh, a series of recommendations, 10 recommendations for how countries uh, can prepare themselves for the, for the next emergency situation, of course, in an era where we have challenges like uh, climate change, uh, there's always going to be another, unfortunately, emergency around the corner. So there's, there are things that countries need to do to prepare themselves uh, and be ready once uh, again. And, you know, I think it's, it's worth remembering uh, the panic that the pandemic caused. Now the pandemic is formally be declared as over, uh, it's very easy to slip away uh, from um, thinking about these types of reforms, but I really urge people to re remember the urgency of, of, of the problem. So just to unpack this then in a bit more detail and explain how we, how we got to this situation. So the book is a, a collaboration between International Idea 
and the Electoral Integrity Project at Newcastle University. Um, we worked with them trying to identify really two core questions. What were the effects of the pandemic on electoral integrity? Uh, what do countries do? And what worked? And the methodology here was uh, we used mixed methods. So the, the main method initially was to, was to commission country case studies in real time, uh, looking at how each election was, was um, adapted for the pandemic, what happened uh, and what worked. So one of the main uh, elections, uh, the national elections that seemed to be most um, affected by the pandemic because of its timing was, was the South Korean elections um early early on so we commissioned a kind of case study that kind of identified what was done by the national electoral commission in south korea and what was effective and then over time we built up these case studies uh, looking at france was one of the early ones there as well where there was big questions about um postponement Could, is it legal is it allowed to postpone an election germany where very quickly countries were uh, uh, where all postal voting was used uh, in an election and this raised questions about whether this should be the way forward. But then over time, lots and lots more exciting, exotic, exotic places where unfortunately we didn't get the chance to go visit, but um, you know, there's lots of lessons to be learned from that. Although I did visit this place, this is my local polling station, just, just, for, info, just for info. So we did country case studies, um, but also looked at um, some comparative practices as well. So international idea, Alongside us, uh, kind of had a country tracker looking at where post uh, elections were, were postponed. For example, looking at collecting news stories and collecting all these kind of comparative information. Uh, we also had a survey of uh, within the UK of poll workers to identify their experience, but also a survey of electoral authorities as well. And this all kind of feeds into the mix of of of, of the story. So. Worth saying from the start, we what do we mean by electoral integrity? Well, the approach that we tend to use, um, the Electoral Integrity Project now tends to use more is, rather than seeing electoral integrity in terms of international standards, is to see electoral integrity in terms of some core democratic principles, because obviously international standards for running elections during a pandemic did not exist uh, at the point at which the pandemic started. Of course, there were some general commitments about emergency elections, but actually there was nothing necessarily to kind of go to. And so we kind of generally push to these kind of core principles about what good elections uh, should look like. And these are useful uh, for thinking about what should happen during a pandemic and what types of reforms should be, should be implemented. And so in the book, we look at several things. The first question is, well, did the pandemic cause uh, the spread of the virus? Did it worsen the spread of the virus or not? What was, what was the case there? We then look at how pandemic affected different parts of the electoral process. So timing of the election, the campaign, voting processes, lecture observation and cost of elections, and then go through um, country case studies before sort of drawing out some of the, sort of the general sort of lasting lessons. So oh, I'm obviously not going to go through the whole book here. Instead, it, it's all it's available on the IDEA website. It's completely free for everyone to download. It's quite big, so it takes a little while to download, um, but it's, every, it's there and for, you know, for, every, for everyone to, to use. So instead, I'll just pick out just some uh, particular themes. So the first theme is, well, did the pandemic spread uh, elections? So did the pandemic spread, um, so did elections uh, contribute towards the spreading of the virus during the pandemic? And uh, one of the chapters provides a bit of a review of the literature on this topic. And the picture overall was actually very mixed. If there's one consensus point, then it seems to be that campaigns were probably uh, the point at which uh, the virus was more likely to spread, where you had campaign rallies. Uh, campaign rallies tend to, by their nature, involve lots and lots of, of more people, tend to be involved in them coming together at one single point in, in time, and often tend to be much less organised, and so it might mean that uh, it's difficult to have regulations uh, put in place. So that was the, probably the point at which there was more sort of scientific evidence of, of elections actually spreading uh, the virus. It seems much less the case that actually this happened at polling stations, uh, which was probably everyone's initial uh, concern. Now, probably the reason for this was a story of success. Actually, electoral officials successfully planned, they put procedures in place, and they stopped 
um, polling stations being replaced that's, that's, that spread the virus. So I think in an era of democratic backsliding, uh, it's easy to lose the good stories and the good news stories here was really one of, of democratic resilience in, in, many, in many respects. One theme that comes through the book is postponements and postponements were uh, you know, rife throughout the pandemic period. And, and we, we tried to do a little bit of research about uh, um, postponements prior to the pandemic. We asked uh, electoral management bodies of examples that they could give of um, elections that were postponed prior to the pandemic period. And they really struggled. There are actually very few concrete examples that they could give. I mean, in the UK, we had one, for example, because of foot and mouth. Um, but in general, uh, postponements were comparatively rare, it seemed. Whereas during the pandemic, there was an enormous number of elections postponed, um, especially at, at, at the start. And yet, at the same time, there were also countries that sort of ploughed ahead. And this opened up some what exactly is the right approach in this situation. Now, as you might imagine, postponements declined as the pandemic progressed. Right at the start, it was almost, you know, they outnumbered those countries uh, that were actually continuing with, with the electoral process. As over time, this declined. Um, and we did some sort of work to think about this sort of in more theoretical terms. And we kind of um, we kind of concluded that actually postponements were OK, where there, were, where, where there was a strong humanitarian case for uh, postponing elections. Elections obviously are there to do a number of things. It's also, they are there to sort of improve the well-being of citizens. So to hold a, an election during a pandemic, uh, which could actually you know, harm citizens' uh, well-being their, and, and, and their health would be very kind of counterintuitive. Um, but actually working out when the, the humanitarian case was there and when actually this was a case of, um, a incumbent wanting to postpone the election because they thought they had a better chance of winning is a very difficult issue and, is, and i think is you, know, you can only really decide more on a kind of case by case um basis so i mean what we could say historic you know, postponements were historic uh, postponements declined ele local elections were much more affected than the national elections but what was particularly important was the length of the delay was enormous so it wasn't just that there was a question about how long you delay the election, but the, the delay in the election varied uh, considerably. So some countries, I mean, New, New Zealand comes to mind, for example, where they were very clear with their communication, they were going to postpone it for a certain period of time. Likewise, in, you know, in, in Argentina, it was for a short period. By comparison, you saw Hong Kong, you saw the UK actually postponing elections for uh, a year or more. And this was, you know, quite problematic, I think, from the, from the perspective um, of uh, not enabling people to uh, cast uh, their vote. But also that process of deciding whether to delay and how to delay was also varied quite a lot. Argentina was a really good example of how countries, of how um, stakeholders came together. There was consultation with the opposition to try to build trust about, about that process. In other countries, that did not seem to be the case whatsoever. So. Again, in the UK, for example, it seemed that the government was making kind of unilateral decisions about uh, whether to postpone or not postpone uh, the election. Uh, it didn't seem to be involved in the opposition. And this leads to kind of criticism. Uh, it leads to kind of party politics around the decision, which doesn't necessarily have to have to take place. And that, and that was a real you know, learning, learning point. And importantly, also, countries didn't seem to have much of a consensus in terms of actual clear legal guidance for when a postponement should be allowed and that's something which we think should be kind of picked up on um, in, in the future. The voter turnout was one of the other, one of the other themes just to just to play out. Um, turnout did decline during the pandemic. This is the these are the change in national election turnouts. Of course there's lots of things kind of going on uh, that cause turnout to go up or, or down but generally speaking the trend was for lower turnout. But this was much more substantial um, at local elections or subnational elections where the turnout decline mattered. So, in other words, they're kind of there are second second order effects going on here. But also, these these declines varied a lot, and there are things that that could have been put in place where you had a long delay, turnout uh, went down. But also where you had mitigating procedures put in place, like postal voting, for example, postal voting 
was the crucial one, then you would not see um, that, that, that decline. But also a sec an important part of the story there is, is disenfranchisement as well. So we often overuse the word disenfranchisement, but actually some countries didn't have, um, they had on the one hand requirements for people to stay at home for the purposes of the pandemic because they might spread uh, the virus. You know, if they were contagious on the day of the election, they were legally uh, had to stay at home. But sometimes there was not actually a process in place like a proxy vote or um, a postal vote to enable them to cast their votes so that they literally were disenfranchised on the day of the election. And this is something which countries can and should, and should take forward. And the last thing, just the last thing just to pull through is, is some of the increased costs that electoral management bodies faced, unexpected costs, supply side costs. You see some of the figures here. Um, and so again, this raises questions about um, how prepared are EMBs? Do they have reserve funds? Do they have procedures in place to ask for more money uh, where, the, where, this, where, the, where this is necessary? Um, because it did seem the case that you had sort of big increases in terms of the amount of money that, that, that they needed, but also um, many, many EMBs saying they didn't actually have enough money to, to run the election. And this leads to sub, substandard provision for, for voters and in some countries they actually also um, post you know, decided not to run the election in Australia and Jamaica so local elections just to save money um, so literally uh, democracy being, being cut, cut through so in terms of conclusions and recommendations you know these were the sort of threats these are kind of the effects or potential effects that the pandemic thought to have but there was a range of interve interventions uh, that uh, EMBs put in place um, and you can see here also some of those that seem to be sort of successful or, 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 less, or less successful. And clearly, I can't kind of cover everything uh, within, within this presentation. Everything's sort of there in the book. You know, we look at election observation and, and, and other elements there, there too. But I think the crucial message that we want to kind of, kind of put across is just that you know many of the problems that countries experience were old problems. And if they fix those problems in the first place, and then in the future emergency situation. Uh, they should be much better prepared. Um, thanks so much. Um, welcome kind of comments and questions at the end. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for a great presentation, uh, Toby. Uh, last year, uh, presidential and local election in Korea were held. Uh, it means I participated in election twice last year. Whenever going to uh, polling station, I'm a bit worried about being infected by the COVID-19 and my wife was pregnant, but uh, nothing happened. <laughs> so I believe it was quite safe to show, show up in polling station during the pandemic for, uh, based upon my experience. So anyway, uh, based upon my experience, I'm very interested in reading your book, I definitely will read your book uh, in this weekend or <laughs> next week. Okay. Uh, our next presenter is Robert. Uh, are you ready, Robert? Yeah, let's see. Let's just get okay. the slides going. Okay. Um, today I'm presenting a paper called Holding Elections During Future Pandemics and Other Emergencies lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic, for which uh, Tom Maloney, who's in the audience, is the co-author. The paper is based on the findings of the African elections during the COVID-19 pandemic project, which was funded by the UK government's uh, Global, Challenge, uh, Research, uh, Global Challenges Research Fund and the Newton Fund. It ran between September 2020 and September 2021, and involved a collaboration uh, between researchers from the University of Edinburgh, where Tom and I are based, the Open University of Tanzania, the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, and the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, who worked with the Central African NGO, Echelle. If you'd like to visit the project webpage, uh, hopefully Tom is uh, dropping a link for it in the chat just now. The AECP project had three main aims. Uh, firstly, to evaluate how risks of COVID-19 transmission were being addressed during African elections. Secondly, to assess how the pandemic affected 
political participation, and thirdly, to produce uh, evidence-based and context-specific recommendations for mitigating the impact of COVID-19 during upcoming African elections. And we envisage that these would also, uh, these recommendations would also be of use in other low and middle income contexts. The project conducted in-country research during each stage of national elections in Tanzania, Ghana, and the Central African Republic. And this involved a convergent mixed method study design that included nationally representative population-based surveys on a range of COVID-19 related attitudes and experiences, observation of the electoral process, and qualitative interviews with government employees, political parties, civil society actors, and EMB staff. We also uh, conducted qualitative research during Kenya's March 2021 by-elections with a focus on EMB mitigation measures and the level of adherence to them during polling and tallying. Uh, working papers covering all the case studies individually are available uh, on the project website. So is the briefing paper that focuses on reducing the transmission of COVID-19 specifically during African elections that Tom Maloney and I prepared in April 2021. In September 2021, Tom and I also published, in partnership with the Westminster Foundation for Democracy, evidence-based recommendations for holding elections during future pandemics and other emergencies. And the paper we are presenting today uh, draws heavily on them. Our recommendations cover a lot of the same ground as those in um, the recent book by uh, uh, Toby and his colleagues, uh, which we heard about during the first presentation. And I think it should be viewed as a positive that there seems to be a lot of consensus between the two projects about many of the lessons that should be learned from the pandemic. Rather than trying to mention everything, uh, in today's uh, presentation, we've chosen to focus on five of our more significant findings. In our paper, we distinguish between measures to prepare for future pandemics that should be taken now and those that can only be taken in the event of a new pandemic outbreak once there's a better understanding of what exactly it looks like. A clear example from the first category is that electoral laws should be updated to better cover contingencies relating to emergencies. Depending on the country, the rules governing elections are established in a range of documents, which can include constitutions, uh, specific electoral laws, codes of conduct, and EMB operating guidelines. These rules often contain few or no provisions relating to health emergencies, the circumstances in which elections can be postponed, or exactly which bodies and individuals should be creating and enforcing safety protocols. If these elements are not in place before a crisis is underway, there may be undesirable delays in decision-making where new legislation needs to be passed, or amendments to electoral arrangements might be made without legal basis. Additionally, the process may be rushed and not subjected to adequate scrutiny, leaving clear potential for manipulation and undesired consequences. We argue that it is therefore important that countries update their relevant electoral laws to ensure that sensible and transparent processes for responding to future crises are established in advance and properly cross-referenced in all relevant documents. This process should involve a consultation with actors from across the country's political spectrum, and new rules should be worded in a way that reduces opportunities for political instrumentalization. The updated legislation may also include a means of external validation for electoral decision-making through which the advice of carefully selected international or regional organizations may be required before decisions about postponements and cancellations are made. Funding for elections that take place during health crises should also be considered in advance. The measures designed uh, to reduce the risks of viral transmission during uh, elections come at a financial cost. This is something we were hearing in the first presentation. As our research shows, high-income countries are far better equipped to observe, absorb these costs than low- and middle-income countries. 
even once it's appreciated that the measures applied in high income countries are likely to be more expensive. So some simple measures to prevent transmission, such as introducing hand washing buckets or sanitizing electrical materials, appear to be relatively inexpensive. However, once these measures are rolled out nationwide, which can often involve supplying tens of thousands of polling stations, the costs become substantial. Many low and middle income uh, countries' governments cannot meet these requirements, so additional budgetary support will be required if elections are to be administrated uh, effectively during a future emergency. So we, we therefore argue that a mechanism potentially provided by the donor community that can offer emergency, budget, emergency budgetary support for electoral management bodies in low and middle income countries is desirable. Such a funding mechanism would be difficult to put in place at short notice, so it would be better to establish it before a new emergency. As the budgets of EMBs tend to be fungible, this money could be specifically ring-fenced and only released if an election is taking place during unusually challenging circumstances. One major advantage of such an arrangement is that it could be used in other emergency conditions, such as when elections are scheduled to take place in countries recently affected by uh, natural uh, disasters. Um, during some elections, including in our case study countries, many voters will either choose to vote in an area where they do not live or find themselves registered in a different place. Uh, this issue particularly affects citizens who've migrated within their own countries, something that is often but not exclusively related to patterns of urbanization. In high-income countries, arrangements such as postal voting can be effective in addressing issues such as this. However, in many low- and middle-income countries, uh, there aren't uh, the resources and infrastructure to implement similar solutions. As a result, in some countries, many citizens will travel to another area to vote. And this creates clear risks in the event of a health crisis, as mobile voters may increase the geographical spread of viral infections by either carrying them to or from their place of residence. The journeys that mobile voters uh, are required to make, which often take place on public transport, may also lead to greater risks of transmission for them and other passengers. Therefore, whilst acknowledging that these voting patterns can emerge for complex reasons, reducing the number of voters who travel during elections can lessen some of the risks associated with holding an election during a future pandemic. Moving on to recommendations for what should be done once a crisis is underway, we argue that advice on how to deal with specific pandemics should be tailored to, con to context. So a lot of good quality recommendations concerning holding elections came out early in the COVID-19 pandemic, such as those from IFES and a group of researchers working under the auspices of the British Academy. However, our study highlights the ways in which the recommend, recommendations provided are not always suitable for low and middle income contexts. Where, the, where there are financial and structural uh, limitations on the measures that can be implemented. In the paper, we give several uh, examples of the measures that are not available in some parts of the countries, including our case studies, in some parts of countries uh, which include our case studies, due to uh, factors such as unreliable postal services, poor internet coverage, unreliable electricity provision, and the absence of large buildings. When a new pandemic emerges, a range of academics and international election experts are likely to again offer advice on how to mitigate uh, the risk of holding elections. We believe that they should be clear about the context in which their recommendations are designed to be applied and that realistic solutions should be offered for low and middle income countries. The final recommendation we want to raise is that measures should be taken to increase public compliance with safety protocols. Many of the simplest measures for preventing the spread of viruses require a large amount of public compliance. However, evidence from our case study countries suggests that this cannot be taken for granted, as often citizens were either unaware of or ignored 
many COVID-19 protocols during election campaign events or on election day. We also found that politicians frequently ignored measures taken to reduce the risk of transmission during campaigning. For example, during the large rallies and door-to-door -door canvassing that are now commonplace in many low and middle-income countries. We argue that widespread compliance with election-related protocols can be boosted if the public better understands the risks associated with the pandemic and why the protocols are important in reducing transmission. This requires continued public education on the health crisis more broadly, but changes should also be made to voter education so that the new protocols are fully incorporated in standard instructions on how to vote and any alterations to the procedure are explained. Another way that compliance can be improved is to have clearer guidelines on how the protocols can be enforced. Procedures for correcting non-compliance need to be established and they should contain proportionate penalties for serious or repeated breaches. It also needs to be clear who is responsible for undertaking this enforcement. Issues of compliance should not be an afterthought, particularly as new legislation may need to be introduced. If you're interested in hearing more of our recommendations, I would encourage you to read the Future Pandemics briefing paper uh, that is available on our project webpage and uh, feel free to get in uh, contact with uh, either me or Tom uh, via our uh, email. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> excellent presentation about uh, COVID-19 and election in Africa. Uh, in my institution, I'm teaching African politics. So after, uh, after watching Robert's presentation, I decided to add the topic of COVID-19 and election in Africa to my next year's African politics show up. Uh, next presenter is Toby. Uh, I'm, I, I was surprised that conference organizer has two presentations in my panel. <laughs> so Toby, do you need time? to take rest for a while, or can you proceed to have our yeah. next presentation? So thank you so much, and great presentation uh, from, from, from Robert and Tom, and, uh, and great project as well. I think I very much agree. I think the fact that we're all sort of pointing uh, in, in the same direction in, in many ways is a good news story. Um, I guess one key issue then becomes um, how, we, how we get these things to, to kind of to happen. Um, so this presentation is, is me again, uh, but is importantly a co-author paper with Holly Ann Garnett. So um, this is something we've been working on uh, together. And it's very much um, an academic paper, but again, also has policy um, implications. And, and as we shall see, these are sort of implications, um, which again, converge around many of these kind of key, key points. So I'll just by very briefly say something about the ex existing academic literature on emergency elections and COVID-19, the pandemic and electoral integrity, um, before kind of introducing the data that we've used to um, evaluate the effects of, 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 the pan, of the pandemic. So I think, you know, we know, I think as the presentations that we've had already have revealed, actually prior to, the, the, to this pandemic, there's very little known about how pandemics and emergency situations uh, affect electoral integrity. Um, this was kind of very quickly corrected um, insofar as there are lots of initial papers um, were, were published looking perhaps to prescribe some prescriptions on you know, what could be done based on what, what we know, such as the British Academy uh, report, for, for, for example. And then quickly, there are lots of individual country case studies emerge kind of documenting what had happened in uh, including those published by IDEA and what happened in South Korea, or what happened in Nigeria and, and so on. Um, but I think it was still the case that most of the early literature tended to be very much um, either policy based, policy grey literature based, uh, or tended to be kind of focusing on, on single countries, uh, perhaps analysis, analyzing the effects of the pandemic on turnout, looking at a particular election in, in, in a particular country. Um, and so one of the things that the project did um, was to try to uh, collect some more systematic data 
looking um, across countries around the world to see actually how uh, the pandemic has was affected elections. And we're now at the point where we're able to kind of feed all this all this back. So what is electoral integrity? I think, as I said in the earlier presentation, we tend to view electoral integrity in terms of demo democratic principles. So it involves um, opportunities for deliberation. You must, candidates must be free to contest elections, but also you have to think about the quality of deliberation that happens uh, during a, an electoral period. It's good that people discuss uh, the quality it's good that people discuss policy options and that debate is informed. It's important that we have uh, equality of contestation, that the rules are sort of fair uh, for, for everyone to, um, to compete. It's, it's a level playing field. The, the idea of democracy is that we're all supposed to be sort of stand equal uh, against, the, against each other. There's supposed to be good quality electoral management. It's important that actually the election is run smoothly. We don't have long queues at polling stations, uh, that ballots are kind of counted um, accurately, and that we have high levels of participation. Uh, elections are at, are at their best when you have um, equality of participation, lots of people participating, and no particular group less likely to participate. Otherwise, their voice uh, is reduced at elections. And then what I think really kind of came through as an additional principle was this idea of certainty of, of the rules of the game, the idea that ahead of an election, we know what the rules are, everyone knows, um, everyone can predict those rules, and that introduces an element of, of obvious kind of fairness as a, as a result. So, I mean, thinking about um, electoral integrity, thinking about this topic a bit more conceptually, uh, what we do in the paper is try to think about the, a concept of electoral integrity uh, resilience. Now, resilience is something that has been used um, in lots of literatures, lots of different disciplines. Um, you know, here, for example, uh, positive psychology talks about individual level resilience and thinking about the resources that individuals could have to be able to overcome a particular problem or a particular kind of trauma. Trauma. There's also literature on kind of organisational. Uh, resilience, what are the properties of you know, public sector organisations uh, that again will enable to, them to kind of overcome a particular challenge, uh, a particular crisis, a particular exalt is often a shock, shock. And there is a literature particularly also in terms of um, democracy and the democratic backsliding and democratisation uh, where um, colleagues develop this idea of democratic resilience again to think about how countries uh, respond to this. But what we were interested here is particularly uh, the idea of electoral integrity resilience and what, what the properties of electoral integrity resilience would, would involve. So the way we sort of thought of this was you had this sort of shock, um, some, some kind of major effect happening. You then have these sort of properties of a, of a country system, which would include the organisation, the electoral organisation, the resources, the economic resources, uh, which are really important as the last presentation was, was showing. And then within that kind of context, you get lots of actors making up their strategies and responding. And then you get to some, you get some kind of institutional adaption to uh, the problem to a greater or lesser extent. So what we would kind of expect to happen um, is that a number of things, pretty straightforwardly, you know, we expect uh, the effects of the pandemic um, on the quality of elections to vary according to a number of factors. Um, first of all, the timing when the elections were held in terms of the, the ecosystem or the lifespan of, of the pandemic. Early elections in the pandemic period might be more likely to be affected, but over time we would expect this to diminish. Maybe also um, the number of cases in the pandemic might, in that particular country at the time of election might also affect how um, the quality of election was was affected, but also potentially there are some specific things about um, I speak to the resilience of the country. So we develop hypotheses, you know, thinking about obviously maybe the quality of democracy. If you have a liberal democracy, maybe that country has the greater accountability mechanisms, free speech that enable electoral management bodies or politicians to be called out for any mistakes or errors that, that, that they make. GDP absolutely crucial from the last presentation you can see how that could be one crucial factor to think thinking about how that might protect 
country's uh, kind of resilience, but also the you know autonomy and um, the capacity of the electoral management body there as well. So how we how we did this? So the electoral integrity project runs uh, the perceptions of electoral integrity index. Um, it's been running this since two thousand and twelve. This basically involves a survey of experts, um, country experts, um, academics who have published on elections in that particular uh, country, and ask them to evaluate the quality of elections for each uh, for each national election as, as we go through. We have, in the last three years, we added a rotating battery to that to that survey. So. Um, in addition to the main questions, we had, we had specific questions asking, asking about what the effects of the pandemic were on uh, electoral integrity in that country. Uh, and we're, the data uh, kind of covers here 143 national elections during that three year period. Um, and the data is all kind of uh, we've, we've published um, PEI 9.0, but 9.5 will contain these kind of this, this data um, as well. So the questions that we included um, are there. I'll just share them very briefly on the slide. Um, so just half a dozen or so questions looking at how the pandemic was was, was affected. Um, importantly, what we do is we reverse code these um, to positive uh, questions as well to give us um, a, to make sure questions are all sort of pointing in the right direction to enable analysis. And these questions, the idea here is that these all align uh, with those five democratic principles for electoral integrity that we set out at the start of the presentation. So we've got one overall measure for the quality of elections, you know, emergency conditions weakened electoral integrity, one for uh, opportunities for deliberation, one for cont contestation, one for participation, and then we did have two for electoral management and delivery, and then there's kind of an index score there as, as, as well. So, well, did electoral integrity decline during the pandemic? It was widely thought that it would. We, you know, we, we, there was kind of narratives of this would feed into our current trajectories of democratic backsliding around the world and would be a, be a major problem. We're just looking at the, the raw PEI index, so basically the, the overall quality of elections in those countries, which does not include the, the rotating battery that I'm talking about. You can just see um, how it's, the index score has been fairly steady over time, and there isn't an immediate. There doesn't appear to be an immediate um, decline. Yes, there was a decline between 2019 and 2020, but um, we didn't find that to be statistically significant. Um, I mean, to some extent, there was an upward lift. Um, again, not statistically significant. So it's not obvious that there was a huge dent in electoral integrity at a kind of very aggregate. Uh, kind, of, kind, of, kind of level. Um, but was it the case that particular aspects of, of the election uh, were, were, were affected? Um, now using the rotating battery, you can see here um, where basically um, you see the extent to which each component of electoral integrity was affected. Now five is a positive, as one is, is negative, um, so what we're looking at here, what this kind of demonstrating is that deliberation and contestation were, were the most effective, most affected. Uh, institutionalization, um, electoral management quality less uh, affected according to, according to this. But this is at the overall level over a three year period. And I think what's, what's important to see is that actually timing of elections was very important here. So these are some correlations between uh, the day since the pandemic was declared according to the world health organizations and some of those in, in those indexes here and you can see actually there's a very positive correlation over time it isn't really a surprising story but, but it kind of in some way speaks to the robustness of, 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 of the findings but there is a clear effect um, of the quality of election improving during the pandemic period according to those particular indexes so timing was was clearly quite important. Interestingly, the number of cases wasn't. So it, it seems to be much less about how many cases there were in a particular country. It's more the, the actual shock announcement of, of the pandemic is, is, is playing a kind of crucial, uh, crucial role there. So 
I think it's important to say that timing was important. Overall, that maybe you don't see major effects over the three year period, but actually, again, if you look at some of the components, um, uh, look at particular countries, you can see actually that using these battery of, of, of questions that some countries did see a major impact on electoral integrity and quality. So the next few diagrams are scatter plots. You can see date along the bottom, and you can see responses to the to some of the battery rotating battery questions here. To say five is positive, one is, is is negative, and as we go through each of these figures, you can see clearly see an upward trajectory, showing that that, that, that timing uh, was 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 important, uh, but also outliers here. So that's the overall kind of question. Um, the next question kind of looks at this is opportunities for um, for deliberation. The question was, but whether emergency conditions limited opportunities to campaign. You can see there at the bottom there, Mali, Mali Montenegro, uh, Iran, uh, early elections uh, where experts are saying that they, there wasn't a, a significant effect. Korea, um, not so much uh, of an effect, for example. In terms of quality contestation, again, Korea doing pretty well, Iceland doing pretty well. Those at the bottom include countries um, uh, such as uh, Syria, uh, Sri Lanka, Central African Republic. You can look at participation here, the same, same kind of country, same, same story in many way. Again, up, an upward trajectory. Um, and then lastly, um, well, electoral management quality. And then rural institutionalization as well, in terms of how the pandemic was affected. So timing was really important. But what about those resilience factors? Did, did they kind of come to bear? Did they seem to be partic particularly important? So in the paper, uh, which can happily share to anyone who's interested, um, we look at some of the uh, random ordinarily square regressions to see what was actually uh, important, what played or played a role. And of those that, 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 that stood out um, days since the pandemic was declared um, was found to be particularly important. Um, the VDM Liberal Democracy Index, as you might expect, was important, but only for some some things, not for everything. It's particularly important in terms of whether the incumbent could benefit from the campaign and also the election, the election scheduling. And then EMB capacity and autonomy, again, was, was important here in terms of providing, uh, making sure that um, vulnerable voters and poll workers um, were, um, were protected. Um, so, in addition to I guess, Robert's and um, Thomas's points about um, you know, resources in, in a particular country, you can see how capacity and autonomy for the EMB are really, were really, really important for actually delivering uh, many of these things. We also look at turnout and whether turnout was sort of, sort of affected um, and run some of the regressions uh, through this as well. Things that kind of came out here, again, day since the pandemic was particularly important but also voting facilities as well. The more voting facilities that were in place in a country, the less likely that it was that, that um, uh, citizens were hesitant to vote. So if you had multiple voting methods, um, citizens were less likely to be um, you know, hesitant to actually go and cast uh, their vote. So it just shows the importance of special voting me mechanisms as a way of uh, protecting electoral integrity. So as I say, Paper, we're very happy to share. I think it points to a very similar story uh, to the policy literature, um, but um, you know, you know, we're very grateful to all the academics that completed the surveys of, of, over the past three years. Um, and I think, again, this is this key message, isn't there, I think, about the longer term lessons for protecting elections uh, for, for a future pandemic. And some of those lessons are, are old lessons. You know, EMB capacity, EMB uh, autonomy, multiple voting methods, um, but we just need to keep saying that message again and again because that seems to be what the academic literature is, is pointing to. Thanks so much uh, for listening um, and um, welcome any comments or questions. Mm -hmm.